Um, uh, okay, Rohit, uh, so um, we are uh, now going live then. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Rohit, it says that WebEx recorder error. Okay. I have no issue. I'm no problem. Uh, we'll have no the problem. recorded video on YouTube. No problem. Okay, okay. No, I'm saying you can record it. There is no issue with me. Okay, okay, okay. So, but there is some. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Or you can okay. choose, ma'am, computer instead of cloud. It should work. Okay. Yeah, you can record it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, CV Raman Memorial Lecture organized by the Department of Physics. And this is the second lecture in this series. Um, the first lecture was given by um, Professor T. V. Ramakrishnan, and today we are extremely delighted to have with us um, a very eminent and extremely distinguished physicist, Professor Ajay Kumar Sood from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, to deliver this lecture. Uh, so I welcome you, Professor Sood. Uh, now I would like to request our director, Professor Ajit Kumar Chaturvedi, to address the audience. Professor Yeah, thank you, Professor Maitra. Uh, I am delighted that uh, Professor A.K. Sood is our speaker today evening. Uh, in the last uh, four to five years, several departments in the Institute have built a tradition of annual talks by eminent academics. These talks are in the name of an outstanding former faculty of the department or a national icon. I hope in future our physics department will also start a series in the name of a well-known former faculty of the department. Uh, the purpose of these talks is multifold. A physical visit to the department uh, by a well-known researcher will facilitate interaction with our students and colleagues and can be extremely beneficial. Hopefully, it will also provide the visitor an idea of whatever good things are happening at IIT Ruti. This will help disseminate our strengths in the peer group. COVID has prevented physical visits, and so we are unable to get all that we want from such annual events. But I'm happy that despite COVID, we are able to sustain this annual event. Hopefully things will become normal soon. I know the audience is eager to hear Professor Sood, so let me stop here by wishing everyone a very engaging session by Professor Sood. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, for your inspiring words. Uh, and now I would like to uh, request our head of the department, Professor G.D. Barma, to introduce our speaker to the audience. Professor G.D. Barma, please. Thank you, Professor Tulika. So, Professor A.K. Chaturvedi, Director IIT Roorkee, faculty colleagues and dear students, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor A.K. Sood. Professor Sood is Year of Science Chair Professor in Department of Physics at Institute of Science, Bangalore. He was the President of the Indian National Science Academy 2017 to 2019. President of the Indian Academy of Sciences 2010 to 2012 and the Secretary General of the World Academy of Sciences 2013 to 2018. Currently, he is a member of the Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council of the Prime Minister of India. Professor Sooth's research interests include physics of nano systems such as graphene and other 2D materials and soft condensed matter with a strong focus on innovative experiments related to Raman spectroscopy, ultra-fast time-resolved spectroscopy, 
including terahertz spectroscopy, transport measurements, and X-ray diffractions. He has published more than 445 papers in international journals and holds a few national and international patent. He, his work has been recognized by way of many honors and awards. These include the fellowship of the Royal Society, all the three science academies of India and TWAS, the civilian honor Padamsri by Government of India, SS Bhatnagar Prize, GD Birla Award, Swartz Prize in Physics, Pikki Prize, Goyal Prize, MN Saha Award, and Millennium Gold Medal of Indian Science Congress, Sir C. V. Raman Award of UGC, Homi Bhava Medal of Indian National Science Academy, DAE Raja Ramanna Award of JNCSR, National Award in Nano Science and Nanotechnology by Government of India. Nano Award by Government of Karnataka, GM Modi Award of Science, and RD Brilla Award of Excellence in Physics by Indian Physics Association. He is an associate editor of ACS Nano. So, with this brief introduction, now I invite Professor Su to deliver the lecture. Professor Su, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so let me start sharing the my probably you can see the slides now. Yes, yes we are seeing slides. Slides and am I audible also? Yes, yes. Yes, very much. Very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so first of all, let me start uh, by thanking uh, Professor Chaturvedi, Professor Parma, Professor Maitra for their very kind invitation and for all of you to be here this afternoon to uh, for me to tell you some experiments, experimental studies which we which are going on in Bangalore, uh, in our group, uh, which are in the area of what we call active matter. So, uh, first of all, I hope you will not mind my very assuming title, uh, Physics of Life, uh, uh, which is essentially inspired by a, a review article uh, in, in a few years back in Nature, and I'll come to it. But this is the kind of experiments which you will be doing is looking at emergent behavior in active matter. So, uh, so let me first start. <clears throat> let me see. Uh, let me first start by thanking the people who have made all this possible. Uh, so our earlier experiments were started uh, when Nitin joined us. He is now a faculty in IIT Bombay. Uh, Harsh and Rahul, they looked at the theoretical aspects along with my very close and uh, long-term collaborator, Professor Ramaswamy. Uh, my graduate student, Pradeep Bera, who is now in uh, Raman Research Institute. Roshan Kant is continuing his PhD. He is just joined. And Pragya is a graduate student of my again long term collaborator, Professor uh, Rajesh Ganpati. So, uh, thank you to all these collaborators, which allows me to discuss uh, some very exciting phenomena in active matter. So, uh, so let me start with a very simple experiment uh, that if you take uh, dirty water and put it under a microscope, what you will see are this bacteria which will be moving uh, randomly. Uh, uh, they are alive and they are moving uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, video. So, but if you put many, many of them together, uh, a large concentration, then it is seen and it is known for a, for a while now that all these bacteria 
perform very interesting collective motion. So you can see that many, many of them are cooperating with each other and moving in a very coherent manner. This is also seen in nature. If you go to a forest and look at uh, sometimes uh, this ants, this ants will be moving in a very coherent fashion, uh, either circular, uh, uh, anti-clockwise or clockwise. That is not an uh, interesting aspect, but they'll be performing this very coherent motion, which is called ant wheel. Another experiment which, have, which people have done uh, in the laboratory in uh, 2016, it was reported in science paper that if you take this locus uh, in a sufficient quantity number, they are alive. But if you put them on a Petri dish, you can see that they move again pretty coherently. They do not move uh, individually uh, and they, they do respect the presence of other locus. And this is another phenomena which is known uh, in uh, So all these things also happen when you take bigger animals, namely uh, human beings, and you would have experienced and seen that uh, when they are, uh, when the human beings are in large in number, they also move quite coherently uh, along with the music. And this is a part of the study which was published a few years back in Physical Review Letters. So all these phenomena, they are called flocking, which is a collective motion of uh, so, so living organisms, which we have shown so far by sensing each other's presence, orientation and direction of movement. What is more interesting is that this is an emergent behavior arising from simple rules followed by individuals, as I will show, but and there is no central coordination. So these birds, fishes, animals, they are all coordinating with each other to give this collective motion. So this is something which is well known and is called flocking. Now, uh, all this is a beautiful uh, phenomena, what is seen in what is what we call active matter. So these all, all the examples like animals, human beings, and so on and on a smaller scale you can have uh, this motors uh, biological motors and you can also have uh, uh, in uh, non-living objects like these robots another example i will give in our experiments which are really moving because there is an energy consumption at an individual particle scale which puts them in locomotion and the direction of locomotion is decided by the particle, individual particle. There is uh, so everything is happening at a particle level, but then when there are large numbers, they coordinate with each other and give you some very exciting phenomena. So when this flocking was known, this is known for uh, uh, hundred years or more, then actually more. So people thought in last uh, 40, 50 years that could it be due to telepathic communication between the birds? So they made very exciting, a very interesting statement, not exciting, that there is a mental template of orderly movements in these animals, like the uh, uh, fishes or the bacteria or the birds, which really result in cooperative motion. 
I'll soon show you that this is absolutely wrong. And actually there is a much simpler way to understand it. And this first understanding came from Craig Reynolds in 1987 when he made a very simple computer program. So he said that the particles which he will have, uh, which are like with some shape, they have three simple rules. So the three rules are one, the particles have a small amount of repulsion, which means they do not like crowding, they avoid crowding. Second thing is there is also some attraction, which means they steer towards the average position of neighbors. Like this one will try to go towards its neighbor. And the third one, which is again very important, is alignment, which means this particle will try to align and steer towards average heading of neighbors. So this will also try to uh, go in the same direction as the neighbors. And these three rules, they do not have any uh, uh, obvious leader in these particles. They are uh, uh, having all this, all particles obey these three rules. And he showed. What gets really interesting is when you put a lot together, really have they behave like a flock of birds or fish or whatever you want. So you can see um, now. And they do this with a couple of different simple rules. Program. Uh, that when combined uh, together in a group, uh, you get this uh, really interesting sort of emergent this, behavior. Like you suppose uh, with objects. You'll see they, they break up and reform and do all these interesting things so you can just based on those rules. Experiments. You can put obstacles in between and see. So the first rule here is uh, alignment. And um, so you know, the the obstacles are not too many. many. It will so, what each boy does but is it looks it to its neighbors, its friends, in kind of small radius, um, maybe about two or three body so lengths as long as they are now. And it this averages the position of all of its friends' headings, right, the direction that they're facing. Used. Now, this very first idea of this uh, uh, three, three simple rules uh, brought out very importantly that there, there is no top-down order which is required to see this collective behavior. There is no mental template of orderly flocks, and there is no telepathic communication kind of uh, signs which is at work. So here, this is a beautiful example of complexity arising from bottom-up approach. So this simple program actually turned out it really revolutionized Hollywood in early 1990s. And many movies at that time have used this program or the variation of this program to look at really the collective uh, behavior which you see in movies. So I just thought you might be uh, interested to see one example, which I have taken this small clip from uh, Lion King movie. Uh, this movie is there on YouTube, and you can see that how uh, this uh, program has been used to generate collective behavior. So I will just I hope you enjoyed this and this has been used in many movies like Batman Returns and so on. So in summary, uh, this flocking is a collective obsession. The way individuals work together is more important than they work alone. And this is emergence of order without central command. Individuals have no plan. And a very simple if then rule, uh, you can get order. Now, the effect of all this actually has been in many, many fields. 
And one of the fundamental emergent property of flow is pollution avoidance. And this is what is used now for autonomous cars, the cars without drivers. And it, there are uh, many programs in artificial intelligence, many algorithms which are inspired by this flocking. They are clocking, they are called flocking swarm algorithms. And they, all these programs, uh, all these algorithms really work how the individual entities collaborate with each other to give you this collective behavior. For example, I mean, there are many, many such blocking swarm algorithms, and I have given one example of this book. So this is the paper which I was mentioning in the first slide that there is a very interesting review article uh, in Nature a few years back where the, it, it calls the physics of life uh, and that uh, it says from flocking birds to swarming molecules, physicists are seeking to understand active matter and looking for a fundamental theory of the living world. So the idea is what are the minimum principle uh, uh, which is required to really look at this flocking without really getting worried about the details. Details are also important for many, many things, but the phenomena, can it be understood based on simple principles? So I will now take you to our experiments, what we are trying to do in the last few years. And this is what we work with inanimate objects in my lab. So we do not work with animals or birds or bacteria, but I will tell you a very simple way to work on this is to take these particles. This is a brass rod made with two steps. This is an asymmetric brass rod. This is about few millimeters, four millimeters long, about 0.8 millimeters in diameter. And this has a head and a tail. And this is what is put on a plate, uh, a flat plate, uh, uh, about let's say 10 inches in diameter and it is put on a vibrator. So this vertical vibration really makes these particles move, in a, for example, in a horizontal direction. So we are moving the plate vertically by less than a millimeter at some frequency, let's say 200 hertz. And now you can see that it is moving in the uh, horizontal plane. Now, depending on the shape of the particle, you can decide what kind of motion you want. So this is a run and tumble because the particle shape is slightly different. And now I'll show you towards the end of my talk how using 3D printing, you can design any type of particle, any kind of uh, motion you want, and you have the complete uh, platform open for you to look at very exciting phenomena. So what we are doing, we are shaking the plate by less than a millimeter, uh, by fraction of a millimeter in fact, and you can define a how much is the shaking strength, what is the acceleration of the plate, and here it's an example. In the case of bacteria, you know there is a biological uh, action happening. You have the ATP to ADP conversion. But here in the inanimate objects, the energy is being given from the vibrating platform. This is like the fuel and the particle uh, tilt is like a motor coordinate and direction of motion is set by the particle orientation and not by the external force. So you now let us see a very simple experiment. If you put these particles in a sea or in a collection of brass beads. These brass beads, uh, they form a beautiful crystal, but they are being shaken. Now the brass beads don't move by themselves because they are spherical. They are not uh, asymmetric. So you can put them uh, when the, the medium is much, much more disordered or when it is ordered. And there are interesting things happen when the particle moves, which I will not discuss, but we have discussed in few papers. But what I will uh, focus today in the next 25 minutes is the collective behavior of active particles. 
So I start with our very early experiments and then take you to the recent experiments which are looking at the collective behavior of active particles. So as I mentioned, the inspiration comes from nature. We want to understand flocking. And so far, the picture which people have in the program, which is what is called uh, uh, Reynolds, that Boyd program, or the other models which people have given, that the interaction between the particles is only nearest neighbor. So the particle looks at the particle in front, particle at the back, particle behind, particle in front, and then decides its motion. I will now show you an example in our experiments where the particles are very far apart and they can still interact and form a collective behavior. So that was the first experiment uh, uh, which we started. So now just before I go to that, there is a very interesting uh, work which has been done by Professor Jan uh, Kozin from University of Konstanz in Germany. What he found is something very interesting. Usually we think that these locusts are actually cooperating with each other and giving you a collective motion. But actually he showed this is really the survival strategy for locusts to move. Because what is happening, the locust at the back tries to bite the locust in the front. So in order not to be bitter, the, uh, the locust in the front has to move. And this is what is happening. So he did many clever experiments and he showed that here the cooperation is not the uh, uh, really the reason, but cannibalism is the reason for making this collective behavior. So we started our experiments uh, way back. So we took many, many of these active particles, which we call active particles, polar particles, put them on the plate and found that they are really not doing collective motion. You can see that they are all moving randomly. And we immediately realized this is not surprising because these are inanimate objects and they do not know uh, if they are not sufficient in number that how to talk to each other, how to communicate with each other. So we put the brass beads in between and we showed that when the beads are not many in number, they still have it uh, in core motion. But if we put enough of the beads and the rods are very, very few, let's say 5%, you can now see in real time that all these particles move coherently in one direction, either left or right. And this happens for days together as long as you are vibrating the plate, which means you are feeding energy into the system. So, so what we have been able to show that you can get a collective behavior if, for example, if the beads are 41% in uh, area fraction and the rods are 6%, they do not form a collective behavior and we can define an order parameter which is close to zero. But if the beads become 68%, uh, which, communicate, which help to communicate between the rods, you can see that within 100 seconds, they form a collective behavior. So we can quantify the order parameter and we can see how the order parameter develops. And this is not only for uh, one or two concentration and we showed by making a phase diagram that any combination which is in this green region will give you the flocking Anything in the red region will not flock, and above that will be jamming and some other exciting phenomena, which I will not discuss today. What this graph shows is that if there are 10% rods, then you need about 50% beads to see the collective behavior. But if you have only 5% rods, then you need about 60% of the beads to see the collective behavior. So this is something we showed that the beads have a big role to play in this experiment because beads are really the eyes and ears for mediating interaction between the active particles. So this is how did we show? We, what we did, we followed the uh, 
velocity of each bead because this is done by taking the CCD image by the camera. We can quantify this. What is the velocity of each bead, each particle? And we found that when the rods are moving incoherently without any order, beads are also moving incoherently. There is no synergy. But moment the rods are forming a very collective behavior, the beads also move very coherently. So it induces a coherent motion in the beads, this arising from the rods behavior. So in this snapshot, for example, uh, this is the rod which we are focusing our attention. And you can see that within few seconds, this rod becomes a part of the crowd. And within about 20 seconds, this rod, which was very much away from the flock, becomes a part of the flock. So what is happening in these things that the moving rods, which are, let's say, moving collectively, they lead to the bead flow and the resulting bead flow aligns the neighboring rods. So there is a synergy between rods and beads, and they really cooperate with each other to give this collective motion. Now, uh, so uh, uh, Harsh at that time set up the computer program uh, along with uh, Professor Sriram Ramaswamy. So what they have done, uh, they can reproduce this entire phenomena on a computer. So this is our real rod. They make a rod on computer by assembling like this, and they do the time-driven simulation, track every single collision with the plate and with the, each other, and uh, write the equations, and then saw, uh, and evolve them. There is a rotational noise added in the particle dynamics, and you, they showed in the rod bead medium that when the numbers are not enough, you get it a uh, disordered behavior, but exactly like an experiment, they could reproduce our experiments beautifully by showing a collective behavior in the right conditions. Now you may ask, what is the advantage of computer simulation? Now the advantage is that these experiments are done in a finite size plate, for example, seven, eight inch diameter. But do you, if you want to ask, is it because the plate is finite, this phenomena is happening, or it is a true phenomena? So what you can do on a computer, you can do on an infinite plate, this simulation, by using what is called periodic boundary condition. And you can show that indeed, disorder when the number is not enough, and when the numbers are enough, even in an infinite plate, you get this beautiful collective motion. So phenomena what we are observing in the laboratory is actually a true phenomena and it is not an artifact of the finite size of the plate. So this is very important. And then we went on to see, can we understand it theoretically, this transition? It's like a phase transition from disorder to an ordered behavior. And we set up the equations. So this is what Shriram and Harsh did. So we have the coupling between the density and velocity fields of rods and beads and the orientation of the rods. You can look up the paper for details, but with writing this coupled equation, we could show that indeed there is a threshold beyond which you will have a collective behavior. So after establishing a flocking behavior, we went on to show that there are many other interesting phenomena which happen in this active matter. For example, how can you trap these active particles? Can you trap them? And can you sort them out based on activity? So this is again inspired by nature. People have shown that if you take collection of bacteria and put a barrier like a funnel, they showed a few years back that all the bacteria will accumulate on one side of the chamber. So, they, uh, so these traps of this shape, uh, V-shape, with the angle of 60 degree, helps to concentrate the bacteria. Now, this is what we did the experiments and showed, actually this angle is very important. 
so we took the plate this is without beads now and now we put a trap or a uh, barrier with this like this and we vary the angle of this trap you can see in this various shots and what we showed was that if the angle of the trap is less than 110 degrees 20 degrees then they all come together they all the particles come and get trapped in time but when the angle is 120 degree or more they never ever get trapped they are always free they come inside but again go out so this is a very interesting phenomena from de-trapping to trapping based on the angle of the trap. So, for example, so this was also we could reproduce in simulation, but simulation also gave us something very interesting, which I'll come in a minute. So you have a beautiful phase transition where you have the trap state below 120 and above 120, you have the de trap state. And near the uh, critical value, you have huge fluctuation, what you get in a typical phase transition. So this non-equilibrium phase transition is from free state to a trapped state. Now we ask, if you take two kinds of active particles, which have different activity, can you separate them? Can you sort them out? And answer is again, yes. So what we did, we took two types of particles. One, uh, both are asymmetric, but one has two steps, one has one step, the blue particle. We put them on a plate, they are completely mixed, but after, once we put a trap, which is less than 120 degree, we, we showed that you get only the red particles uh, uh, trapped. Now question is, how do we understand this? which kind of activity will lead to trapping and this is the computer simulation of two types of particles black and blue and what is different in them it is the same shape but the rotational noise which means whether the particle goes straight and rotates or uh, doesn't rotate is what is varying now this uh, simulation showed us very nicely that the particles uh, which are uh, persistent it, in motion, which means which, which do not get deflected, uh, they are the ones which get trapped. The ones which are not persistent uh, do not get trapped and they come out. So here we showed that the trapping is governed by persistence of motion of these active particles. So this experiment showed uh, in summary that there is a non-equilibrium phase transition to a collective trap state and the persistent movers are trapped preferentially and based on this you can have a sorting based on nature of motility characteristic which uh, concentrate the persistent movers inside and noisy movers outside so after this uh, nice things we learn something new because this is this is the phase when we are also learning many many new things in what is happening in active matter so there is a very uh, uh, vibrant field in the last few years looking at the clogging in crowd dynamics now this uh, dynamics of many many people together is something very very interesting and of course it has huge implications for phenomena like stamping. So when you have many, many things moving uh, suddenly towards, for example, a door in a stadium or uh, in any other, like in a kum mela or any other thing, you can have a possibility of a stampede or a jamming in this. So people have been studying this in the context of traffic, in the context of grain flow in a hopper, uh, and immobilization of micron particles and so on. So actually this is a very, very important problem which people have been trying to understand uh, to how to understand crowd dynamics. So you might be knowing that in Mecca, there have been a number of stampedes. For example, between 1980 and 2007, 
there were 215 stamp rates, which is a very large number and many of them are very unfortunate events where a lot of people die. So they have, they were trying to understand this. So many people are working on this problem. And one of the well-known names which you can Google is called Dirk Halbing. He is a professor of computational social science in Zurich, and he has studied crowd dynamics. Crowd dynamics, uh, uh, there are analogies to turbulent flow, where crowd moving in two or three different directions, they collide and get this turbulent behavior. So people have done experiments, uh, for example, uh, in University of Navarra, where they take uh, sheep uh, uh, and then the sheep, they try, they are taken out of yard. The yard is clean and food is placed inside. And when the yard is opened again, all the sheep crowd together in front of the door and try to go through. Now, by looking at the door design and the number of sheep, they try to understand this collective behavior. So this is a very active area of research. So what we did in a very simple experiment, we simulated, we, uh, we uh, put this box with a door here and we vary the number of particles in the door, which is like number of people in a room with the size of the door fixed. The size of the door is 1.85 times the thickness of a rod. This is like what is the size of the door as compared to the thickness of a man or a woman. Now, what we found was that if there were 100, and 100 part, uh, particles, there was no jamming, there was no step rate, 150 it took longer, but when we put 200 particles in the same size of box, and then all of them try to move through, and you get a step rate or a jamming at the door. And uh, you can do another thing. You can fix the number of particles with 200, which is what was giving you the stamp aid. But now the change the size of the door. When the size of the door was 1.33, they all get jammed and there was a stamp aid. 1.85, again, there is a stamp aid, but little more motion. But moment we make the size of the door larger, uh, you will see that they allowed a few particles to go out with time and the stampede could be avoided. So these are very interesting examples which you can study in active matter by looking at the dynamics of these particles. So now let me go to the another example by looking at can the flocking be disrupted? We saw the collective motion. Can you disrupt? So I showed you a video uh, in the Boyd program where they are putting static obstacles. But you will have to put a large number of static obstacles to disrupt a flock. What we have shown now recently in 2020, that if you put these obstacles, which are mobile, then you need a very small number to disrupt a flock. For example, if you have animal flocking, but there is a small fraction of baby animals who do not know how to cooperate with each other. They can disrupt the flock of the animals. And this can also be an extremely useful thing to understand that can you deflock uh, uh, to disrupt the crowd behavior in high risk situations. Supposing there is a high risk situation and you want to have deflocking. Deflocking is what you need. So how do we put it? So what we did, we took these two type of particles, which I told you, persistent behavior, and another type of particle, which is more of a very uh, a very shaky behavior, very uh, not very persistent. Now once we take that, so what we show first, if you take what we call only aligners, which were having a persistent behavior. Without beads also, if you put sufficiently large number, like 30%, they do show a collective behavior because they are large in number and they can cooperate with each other. And we quantified that within about 200 seconds, they will form a flock 
which is very stable. And we can draw the phase diagram that what is the minimum number of particles you need to see a flocking. But if you take these dissenters, which were very, uh, 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 very fluctuating, we found that if you even if you take 70% of them, they will never form a flock. So they do not like flocking, whereas this and the other particles like flocking. So we took them and we showed actually that if you can take 35% of aligners, put 2% of uh, dissenters, they do not disrupt the flock. But if you put sufficient number of uh, uh, dissenters, they can also disrupt a flock. So we exactly know how much dissenters you need. For example, if your number of aligners are 25%, then you need about 10% uh, dissenters to disrupt the flock. So in this phase diagram, it tells you that by using other type of active particles, which do not obey the similar rules, you can disrupt a flock. So, uh, so this small uh, example which I gave was to show that the centers, they introduce more noise to the system and they destroy a liner's correlation. And uh, as I showed you, this can be very important for real life examples where you may like to disrupt a flock. Uh, by using these disruptors. Next example is again very exciting that there is a very beautiful thing which you see in real life all the time and this is called non-reciprocal attraction. So what it shows is that supposing you have two these active particles, this blue particle, blue bird, is highly attracted to the red one. This could be a human being also. But this red one is not very much attracted to the blue. Now, this is what you call non-reciprocal attraction, which means A attracts B, but B does not attract A. So there is a whole beautiful physics of non-reciprocal interaction leading to phase transitions. This is in a very recent paper. This is a very, very beautiful paper. I have taken picture from that. And we want to study this experimentally. So what we are doing now in a recent paper, which is on the corn mat, what we are doing is we have this beads medium. We put two rods. Now you can see these two rods in a medium, which is only 70% beads, which means beads are not ordered. We find that these two rods, they do not attract each other. But when you put 78% of the beads, these two rods become very, uh, they attract each other and they move together. If, uh, if this is also seen in simulation. In a uh, liquid-like uh, medium, they do not come together. But you can see that when the medium is elastic or the crystalline, they move together. So you can see an attractive interaction coming from the medium. This is a beautiful example where the particles can change their behavior depending on the medium. So the, if the medium has elasticity, they attract each other. And if the medium does not have elasticity, they do not attract each other. Now what we showed is, this is something which I just show you the final result. There, there is a whole lot of uh, things in this paper. We took this rod and this rod, which is perpendicular. What we will show you that this rod will continue to move in the horizontal direction as if nothing has happened. But this rod will be attracted to this rod and it will follow very, very quickly. So you can now see, you can see immediately it follows each other. So there is an attraction of the rod which is behind with the front one, but not the vice versa. Now, the reason for this is very interesting. This is in simulation. Uh, see, now it catches up. So immediately they start moving together. Now, this one is an example. What is happening is that the rod which moves, actually it creates a non-uniform, inhomogeneous disturbance in front and back. 
So the in the back, the disturbance is long lived, long range. In the front, it dies up very quickly. So the particle which is behind starts feeling the presence of the rod, which is moving ahead. So you can see we did the this is in the theory with the uh, this is understood in theoretically as well as simulation as well as an experiment. So all these things again bring out very exciting phenomena of this non reciprocal interaction in active matter. Uh, Professor Verma, do I still have five, seven minutes? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the summary of this part that the long range attraction is seen between motile polar particles in elastic beam medium. And this arises because displacement field is asymmetric. Uh, this is a, this has a longer decay profile behind the particle as compared to in front and elasticity and motility put together lead to non reciprocal attraction between particles. So the last example in today's presentation is a very recent work from the laboratory of Professor Rajesh Garpati in Jawaharlal Nehru Center where I am sitting right now because I have a joint position here. And uh, this is done with a graduate student, Pragya, uh, in this very, very nice way to uh, look at the, this activity all along with chirality, which is what I have completely ignored till now. So what, uh, so let me take you this a new way to make these active particles. What uh, uh, Pragya and Rajesh, they have shown that you can now do 3D printing of this polymer particles. You know that 3D printing is extraordinarily now powerful in the last 15 years. You can print very interesting uh, objects like heart balls and so on. And what they have printed are these polymer particles. These polymer particles, uh, if they are completely uniform, they, they will not be uh, polar, but now they can make the roughness of the surface uh, more rough on one side, half lap on the ellipsoid. This is more rough with the plate. And now you can also put a mass asymmetry. You can drill a hole here. So by playing with the friction of the particle with the plate and the mass anisotropy, whereas the shape is not anisotropy unlike earlier examples, they can show, they have shown that you can play with the activity. For example, when the hole is very close to the center, they don't, uh, they are active, but more active when the hole is moved little away from the center. And when it is very much behind, you can see that these are much, much more active particle than these. So now you can play with the activity. How do you quantify? by looking at the persistence length. So you can see uh, what is the persistence length and how the mean square displacement varies, how is the velocity distribution, and now you can really quantify the activity. You can design the particles. This is the beauty of this uh, very powerful technique of 3D printing. But in the last five minutes, what I want to bring a new aspect of active matter namely the chirality. Now you are all familiar with chiral. You have chiral objects where you know the uh, object is chiral if it cannot be superimposed on its image by pure translation and rotation. For example, these two hands, left and the right hand. Now the uh, lot and lots of molecular systems are chiral in their property, in their uh, structure. And this is very well known in biological systems. And based on the chirality, actually the structural chirality, they have selectivity and self recognition uh, for organizing the matter. What we will show you now is not the structural chirality, but actually chirality in their motion, not in their shape. So this is the particle which I was dealing with. Hole is in, along the major axis. And this only moves uh, in a straight line, in a persistent manner. 
But now you move the hole away from this and it brings whether it is right handed or left handed. You can now show very beautifully depending on the, uh, the mass asymmetry, various things, you can make these particles of different activities which actually move either in a small radius or in a big radius. So you can now play how these particles are moving left or right, depending on the whole, whether it's on left or right, and how much they are chiral, what is their activity in chirality. And this can be quantified, but the, what I want to bring it that there is a very beautiful uh, phenomena which is happening if you take, for example, you put many of them together, you, these particles are moving, uh, one can, um, I will call plus and minus, whether they are moving left or right. And now you can decide the chirality, how much is the chirality of the medium. So, for example, here, you have this activity called C2. One of them is minus chirality, one of them is plus chirality. So, what do you expect? You put them on a plate. I don't know if you can guess. These particles come together. They will form, they will spin around each other together as well as they will move. So, they will form spinners and movers. And if you can uh, show, if you have, uh, for example, uh, uh, these are the spinners. So these particles can form movers and spinners. So very exciting things happen, which I will not go into. But the most exciting thing is this. If we take C2 plus and C2 minus and C4 plus C4 minus, we put them on the plate. And what we found is always C2 will couple with C2 plus minus, C4 will only couple with C4, but C2 will rarely couple with C4. It will couple, form a pair, but immediately break. So there is a beautiful chirality. There is a self-recognition in chiral active matter. So this is what we showed actually, that the C2, C4, they form for a very short time. You can quantify this by looking at the probability how long they will live. C2, C2 live for the longest time, then C4, C4, whereas C2, C4 really don't live uh, for long. So I will just close this by showing you the last slide uh, that what happens when you put many, many of them together. I will not discuss this because there is a lot and lot of uh, beautiful science here, physics here. What we found is that if you take different mixtures, whether it is pure chiral, racemic mixture, no chirality in the mixture, or the full chirality, they move very differently. You can see even visually that the collective motion is very different. So the nature of cooperative dynamics depends on the chirality of the medium. So, uh, so the last section, which is still a, a lot of work is going on, that we have decoupled activity and chirality from particle shape and encoding, encoding chiral activity in a granular matter brings about selectivity and recognition and the net chirality of active liquids has a profound influence on its dynamics. So I will close this talk by just summarizing seven small stories, because seven is a good number in our Hindu, uh, in our way of uh, thinking, not Hindu, but Indian way of thinking, that uh, I presented seven examples, locking in a small number of rods due to bead mediated long range interaction. Only active rods can also flock at high number density. Small number of dissenters can disrupt the flocks. And we also showed the trapping of active particles in a wedge uh, trap below an angle, 120 degrees. We also showed you can sort out the active particles based on their activity. Beautiful example of non-mutual attraction between the active particle. And the last example was the chiral active particle, which shows stereo selection and self -reduction. So with this, I close my talk. Thank you once again for inviting me to give this CB Raman Memorial Lecture. 
and uh, I'll be happy to clear any doubts if any. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Professor uh, Anil. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor, sir, for this wonderful yeah. answer. Now, the session is open for the discussion. I request the participants to uh, either post their queries in the chat box or they can unmute themselves and ask the query. Yeah. Okay. So, we uh, have a question. Some question I can see. But, uh, can you read the question? I it vanished. Yes, yes. Okay. I will. So, you have mentioned that active matter follows flocking. Uh, do you have fear of cannibalism? So, uh, you have mentioned that active matter follows flocking due of fear of cannibalism. Only for locust. Only for locust. Uh, if so, particles can escape from group to protect themselves from killing. Why are they still following the flock? No, no, no. no that's, that's the beauty. See, the reason for flocking can be different in different uh, examples. What was shown that the locusts actually have this tendency so they try to uh, uh, remain alive by cooperating with each other but if you take birds flocking in the sky there it could be the hydrodynamic advantage that uh, the drag is less when one bird moves and the other bird takes advantage of that so the uh, so the cannibalism is only particular to really the locust behavior, not otherwise. Uh, Professor Anil, can I ask one question? Uh, uh, yes, no, my Professor. name is Ajay, Ajay Su. Yeah. Uh, myself also, Ajay, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, yes sir. Uh, yeah, sir. I, sir, myself, Ajay, sir. Uh, uh, I, I was asking uh, uh, the question out of your last uh, uh, slide that you have only two uh, uh, basically uh, particles or two. Uh, objects which are feeling attraction in the elastic uh, background. So the question is, if you have more than two or multiple of two, so uh, say four, six, eight, and your elastic medium is there. So would there will be a four uh, e type or six e or you can say multiple of two e uh, kind of uh, no, situation? No, 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 very interesting question. Actually, these experiments have been done and simulations have been done and they show very interesting collective behavior beyond certain number also. So we uh, actually I don't have the movie with me, but if you take 10 of them, then 10 of them actually try to move together in elastic medium. And, uh, and if they are, uh, so there are many interesting phenomena which happen, which we have not completely understood, honestly. So yes, the behavior is very, very rich. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, because sir, we recently in, in graphene system, uh, the, the, the quieted uh, superconductivity has been experimentally seen in one of the PRL and nature. So they're saying it is more than two. Initially start with two, but you can have a, a very big group of uh, particles, uh, which are even in number. So, the second question, yeah. sir, suppose you have elastic medium. And these particles are collectively moving. What will be the property of elastic medium as a function of uh, these collective particle back? Because uh, the elastic property will uh, tend to modify depending on uh, these uh, number of uh, uh, paired particle. No, I, I think very, very exciting question actually. Uh, it does happen, but we have not studied the effect on the elastic medium. What you are asking is absolutely relevant. We have asked ourselves, but this is the very first experiment which we have done yeah, and yeah. posted on archive. And there is a synergy between the two. You are absolutely right. And how the elasticity is modified, we have not uh, studied or understood. Okay, sir. So yeah, it's is a very interesting very, talk, sir. Yeah. Enjoy it a lot. Uh, but there are very, very simple very, functions. Very, very cool. uh, yeah, very open field actually. Very, very open field, but your question is very well taken and there is a synergy between the two, which we have not studied. So, 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Also, Ajay, and uh, I have collaboration with one of your uh, colleague there at ISC who is working on graphene two D system. Uh, oh, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There is a question from Rajdeep Chatterjee. Rajdeep, can you ask your question? Yes, Professor Sood. So, uh, first of all, yeah. thank you for your talk. And um, yeah, you. I, if I have understood um, the, you know, the, the 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 gist of your experiments correctly, um, you you're getting all this collective behavior in a two D system, right? So, uh, would you experiments are done in 2D, but right. when you see the example of birds flocking or the right. fishes, the fish that is in 3D. Right. So, will there be anything extra when you increase the dimension when you go to uh, uh, to 3D? Something which you don't observe here, but you may yeah. observe there. Yeah. Yes. 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 What you are saying is very uh, very appropriate. Our experiments are done in 2D, but if there is an interaction in 3D, like in real life, birds or fishes or uh, uh, animals, in fact, the similar physics will operate. So our sense is that the direction, the dimensionality of the space uh, is uh, probably not deciding whether to give a collective motion or not. It happens in all dimensions. Okay. So um, it, it can can there be turbulence, for example? I mean, will yes. motion be turbulent? Is, yes. yes, and this is called actually there is a word for it. So what people have studied recently, actually, uh, uh, so so when you have many many of these active particles together, then they, uh, in a certain condition they can have uh, very turbulent behavior. They can have jamming. They can have intermittent jamming. They can have uh, uh, intermittency. So a lot of things happen. Actually. Answer is yes, but the field is just getting explored as we speak. It's not something which is extremely mature. Oh, Answer is yes. Okay. Answer thank, is yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I request Professor Vipul to come in. Hello. Yeah, any other? Sorry, Ripple, you are not audible. So we have Professor Ripple. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, now you can, you are audible. Please continue. Yeah, good evening, Professor Su. This is Vipul Rastogi. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I have just uh, a couple of questions uh, regarding this uh, wedge shaped trap. Uh, so this this angle, which is some magical number, one twenty degree. So uh, is this a universal angle, or does no. it depend upon the type of object and density of beads and other parameters? This is one thing. Again, a very actually very insightful question. I must say, what we have studied that it does not depend on the number of particles. No, but it need not be same for all types of active particles. What you're saying is correct that the, the uh, behavior of the trap, uh, no, sorry, the behavior of particles uh, depends on the type of activity it has. And there is no systematic study or understanding of this so far. What uh, the computer simulations which have been done by the German group they also do not look at various uh, uh, systematic study, but what we are seeing is very, uh, uh, I mean, if you ask me this question, which I will really have to apologize, why 120 degree? Do we know mathematically why it should be 120 degree? Answer is no, but theoretically in our paper, we have shown that there is a critical angle below which the trapping will occur. There is a phase transfer. You can look up our paper because this is a question of how many particles are coming in, how many are going out. So there is a uh, threshold, but the numerical number we cannot uh, cannot understand. Fine. Uh, it means that uh, there is a possibility for two different types of particles to have different threshold angles. And uh, then 
then it would be it would be applicable to of course uh, microscopic system also and uh, so in biological systems we can for example sort two kinds of bacteria or something uh, uh, at different places by putting these kind of edges answer is yes answer is yes that is the motivation okay great that is the uh, actually that is exactly the motivation Yes, yes. And another my, my very small query is, I think uh, it is a bit obvious, perhaps. Uh, uh, we have seen this uh, non-reciprocal attraction. So it, it is very beautiful that uh, we see that these particles are following each other just like ants do. Now ants follow the trail. So here this uh, following is caused by uh, uh, mediation by these beads basically. And uh, this Crea disturbance created by uh, the object in these beads. And in ants, uh, I think it is uh, because of, I don't know, pheromones which uh, one ant creates and the other ant follows that. So, so, so there is a different kind of system altogether. Here it is a mechanical system and there uh, it is some kind of, I don't know, biological system. So is there some connection? Correct. It is just inspiration or can it be mathematically yeah. modeled? No, 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 no. no, actually, absolutely. Very good question, actually. Uh, actually, what happens is that if the interaction is not reciprocal, it can arise from many things. And non-reciprocity actually is a very uh, integral part of activity because there is no reason to be you know, mutual. There is no detailed balance here. The detailed balance is completely absent, uh, unlike equilibrium system. So actually, this non-reciprocity has a counterpart, which is called non-hermitian operators. So non-hermitian operators in quantum mechanics are the ones which are like the non-reciprocal interaction here. So this paper, which I gave you the reference, Nature 2021, actually talks of that also. So this non-reciprocity or the non-hermitian operator in quantum mechanics, a quantum mechanical system, they have many, many interesting things which can arise from chirality, which can arise from elasticity induced attraction, interaction and so on. Many examples. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. I think a question uh, in the chat box, Professor Sood. Uh, can massless right. photons also uh, undergo this kind of a flocking effect? Our particle needs to have mass. Can we see this? We have no, no, no. In case of massless no, no, no. particles. No, no, no. You are saying whether the massless particles will have this. You are saying that? Correct. Correct. I do not know. Actually, it's my uh, complete ignorance. How you will talk of is because these are classical objects which we are talking. Now, in classical objects, what you are doing is you are giving energy to them and they are moving uh, uh, this thing. So, now, how do you take it to quantum mechanical systems? There are now examples. But whether, uh, how much to take it to a massless particle, I have no clue. Because recently it has been shown that if you take 2D electron gas, 2D electron gas in a magnetic field, and you put microwave on it. There is a beautiful exam experiment on microwave absorption by these elect 2D electrons in magnetic field. So the equations of motion of that system are exactly the same as the hydrodynamic equations of proking, exactly the same. So there are parallels in quantum systems uh, for like, for example, electrons, but I do not know the meaning of photons, uh, how they are interacting and so on and non non reciprocal or uh, because here we have to give energy all that non equilibrium system. So I, I will really not know a very uh, uh, rigorous answer to your question. Yeah. I request. Uh, 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 Hello. So, um, thank you, Professor Sood, for this um, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have a question related to uh, the shape uh, of this brass rod you have uh, 
chosen in your experiment. So uh, I'm wondering, um, so you have chosen a rod with the, with diameter tapered in steps. So, uh, so can you tell us, I mean, what is the reason for this? Uh... Oh, okay, good question. So actually you need asymmetry, that's all. Now, in the last example, which I showed on the plastic particle, you can see that they are not even uh, asymmetric in shape, but the asymmetry is coming, uh, for example, in this, what is on the screen, just by putting, playing with the friction. Half of the particle is having more friction with the plate than the other, and there is a mass difference. So any asymmetry will do. Any asymmetry. So the shape is the simplest asymmetry we did when we started playing with it in 2014. But in 2021, with the 3D printing possible, we uh, now we are playing, not we, but Professor Rajesh Ganpati and his group. They are playing with the uh, asymmetry in various other ways than only the shape. So the shape is just one of them. Okay, and 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 what I about hope, uh, yes. uh, Mr. Dr. Imanshu, I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. I Thank you, sir. So, so, what about the what about the length of the rod? Does it does it? No, no, that is not a relevant variable. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor Shu, just a small uh, point. Uh, as uh, you just concluded, uh, that's a very interesting that you have uh, non Hermitian Hermicity is there. And uh, usually quantum mechanics uh, uh, says that non Hermitian say operator has uh, uh, non real or complex eigenvalues. So there will be actually a, a problem uh, when you diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Uh, and and this uh, Hamiltonian will basically produce uh, the, the, the diagonal element which has imaginary parts. So uh, these imaginary parts are responsible uh, now in, in the spectral function as a, a broadening uh, in the in the spectral line. Yeah. So uh, quantum mechanically, yeah. I think uh, uh, these uh, non-hermissivity and uh, the applicable uh, Hamiltonian in terms of the perturbation, which is time dependent and time independent both under the influence of some external field as well, are uh, uh, computationally approachable uh, because some of the group uh, who are working on these non hermitian operators uh, because some yeah. of the materials follow that. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Very Absolutely. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, actually, uh, in recent few years, if you look at this paper and references therein, uh, this field has really moved a lot in the yes. last five years. Yes, and I don't know, you must be following it. If you have a non hermitian operator, but with PT symmetry, parity and time reversal symmetry, then you can get real life values. Yeah, yeah, you yes. Know, there is a, a development which happened 20 years back, and there are beautiful experiments now in optics and so on with non hermitian operator with PT symmetry. Yeah, parity and, and time. They are real, and they are real observations. So all this is happening parallelly in the field. Answer is that it is a very exciting. Exciting field, yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. We have last question, Mr. Su. Do you think principles yeah. of thermodynamics help explain Can you, I, related to this field? Uh, do you think? Sorry, I couldn't. Yeah. Do you think principles of thermodynamics help explain? Any phenomenon related to this field? Oh, let me say very clear. Probably I didn't make it very clear. This is these are systems out of thermal equilibrium. So now you can also talk of uh, uh, what is the situation for active matter and uh, when the systems are out of equilibrium. And there's a whole branch of physics which is called stochastic thermodynamics. And you know many, uh, so where you have fluctuation, dissipation, fluctuation relations and so on. So we have worked on it, uh, our recent work on heat engines for one particle uh, uh, using bacteria as a reservoir has addressed that. So you can look up our paper in Nature Physics few years back, which looks at this non-equilibrium uh, systems. 
Thank you. Uh, now I request Professor Tulika Maitra to offer out of thanks. Okay. Thank you, Professor Gauri Sethi. Uh, good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, on behalf of Department of Physics, IIT Rurki, I sincerely thank Professor uh, Ajay Sood uh, for such a wonderful lecture. And we have all enjoyed your lecture uh, today evening. And we look, look forward to your visit uh, to our institute um, post-COVID um, um, after uh, the um, situation becomes normal. Uh, I also uh, thank Professor Anil uh, Gaurisetti for um, uh, playing an active role in uh, organizing this event. I thank uh, our Institute Computer Center for their support in publicizing uh, this event. Um, I thank our director, Professor Rajit Kumar Chaturvedi, for his continuous support in organizing this kind of events. I thank uh, all the participants who joined uh, through Webex and YouTube Live, um, and we look forward to your active participation in uh, upcoming lecture. And thank you all for uh, making this event successful. And uh, once again, I thank you, Professor Sood, uh, for such a um, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And with this, we come to the end of this event. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, Namaskar. 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 How are you? I am fine, sir. How are you? How is your health? We are doing fine. We are doing very well. Good, sir. Good. Thank 